Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about Trappist-1 system once again because yet again we made a very exciting discovery that both presents us with a new mystery and also allows us to study these beautiful planets opening up a lot of new opportunities for new studies. Specifically here the scientists discovered something unusual about the densities or the composition of these seven planets. But in case you forgot what Trappist-1 is, well, to date, it's probably the most exciting planetary system we've discovered so far. Located about 40 light years away from us, which is, in terms of galactic uh, distances, is actually relatively close. This is the system discovered only a few years ago, when the scientists realized that there were seven very unique and very unusual terrestrial planets orbiting around a red dwarf. With all of the planets being relatively similar in size, relatively similar in mass, and also being located in a somewhat exciting region. Three, or possibly even four of these planets are in the habitable zone of the star system, with all of the planets here now officially confirmed to be terrestrial, meaning that they're not super-Earths, they're not gas giants, they're actually planets like Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth. But all of this took years and years of observations, analysis, and thorough understanding of how orbital dynamics work around these planetary systems. Now, originally we discovered these planets via the Kepler telescope by essentially looking at the shadows passing in front of the star. This is how the scientists were able to determine the sizes of all of these planets. Knowing the size though is not really enough to determine, for example, the mass or the density. You still have to actually find the mass of these planets for us to learn anything else about them. One way of trying to discover the mass of planets is by looking at how much the star wobbles as the planet passes around the star. By measuring the amount of wobble, or basically the amount of motion of the star across the night skies, we can then determine the mass of this planet. But this usually mostly works for larger planets like Jupiter-like objects. So for a gas giant, it's relatively easy for the scientists to determine mass this way. For smaller planets, terrestrial planets, especially planets that only represent a fraction of the total mass of the star system, that method would not really work very well. You would need to have an extremely accurate telescope, which doesn't actually exist yet. Just to give you a comparison of mass difference here, the total mass of all of the TRAPPIST-1 planets represent about 0.02% of the total mass of the star system. Now that's almost nothing. That's actually kind of similar to the amount of mass in all of the moons of Jupiter compared to the mass of Jupiter. Which, by the way, does imply that these particular planets may have been created in a very similar way to the moons of Jupiter. There is actually a very unusual similarity in different orbital patterns and also just in the way that the planets behave compared to the moons of Jupiter. And so by just knowing the sizes of these planets, how did the scientists determine their mass then? Well, there's actually a very interesting method known as TTV or transit timing variation. This method also relies on measuring the shadows of these planets passing in front of the star. But in this case, when there's another object in the star system, such as for example another massive planet nearby, it will start pulling on this planet, thus affecting when these shadows appear compared to our original predictions. So in this case, because of the pull from this planet, the transits now, the shadows, will have slightly different timing. There will be a timing variation. Now this transit timing variation is a very, very precise and actually very interesting method of determining the total masses of all of these planets. And so by looking at transit timing variations of all seven planets, after only a few months, the scientists were able to calculate very precise masses of each of these planets where the transit timing variation made a lot of sense. And now we know, as a fact, what the mass and the size of each of these planets is, with the recent study being the most accurate in determining both. And once you know the size and the mass of each of these planets, finding the density is just a matter of division. Dividing one value by the other, you get the total density of each of these planets. Now, what's really unusual is, of course, the recent discovery and the recent confirmation that the density of each of these planets is very unique to anything we've seen so far. Each of these planets seem to have extremely similar density to each other, and that's something we've never seen before. With the overall planetary density being very, very similar to planet Earth, and also very similar to each other. It's defined as being about 8% less than the density of Earth and the density of Venus. And remember, here we're talking about seven unique planets 
Seven planets that most likely also have somewhat different surfaces, somewhat different atmospheres, and potentially somewhat different composition as well. But in this case, they do have very similar density, and that just kind of doesn't make sense right now. The reason it doesn't make sense is because of the examples we have from the solar system, and actually really from any star system we've seen so far. So just as a comparison, now let's take a look at the solar system and the density of planets here. The highest density of all of the objects is our own planet Earth. The density here is about 5.5 grams per centimeter cube. Then we have the neighbor Venus, then we have Mercury, and then we have Mars. With the density of Mars being about 3.93 grams per centimeter cube. Now usually by knowing these densities, we can then determine what the composition of the planet is and also what sort of materials we can expect to find both inside the planet and possibly even in the upper regions of the planets. Now in this case we know that Mars for example doesn't really have a very large iron core, whereas Mercury, despite its smaller size, probably has a much larger core. And then once we start talking about gas giants, the density suddenly drop. With the least dense object of all being Saturn, the density here is actually less than the density of water. It's about 0.68 um, grams per centimeter cube. And so here, that's kind of what we expect from most of the planets in the typical star system. And for the most part, we've been seeing something similar in other star systems as well. Even if you were to look at the moons of Jupiter, their densities do vary quite a lot. Not as much as the density between Earth and Saturn, for example, but still quite a lot. Between 1.83 grams per centimeter cube for Callisto and 3.53 grams per centimeter cube for Io. But somehow, none of this seems to work for Trappist-1 planets. Each of the planets here, despite the distances to the star and despite their location in the star system, seem to have relatively similar densities, even if their size or their mass is different from the planet next to it. And at the moment, nobody really knows how to explain any of this. There are three potential explanations, but none of them are really conclusive. The first explanation here is really in regards to the cores of these planets. All seven of them might have relatively similar iron cores that are slightly smaller than the core of planet Earth, with the iron cores inside each of these seven planets being roughly around 21% of the total mass of each of these planets. But having a core that's pretty much exactly the same as the core of the planet next to it is very unusual, or it would be almost impossible to explain this in uh, any of the modern uh, planetary formation theories today. Why would these planets have exactly the same internal structure? Currently, there is really no way to explain this. And also, just to give you a comparison, Earth has the core that's about 32% of the total mass, and it's that iron core that gives our planet such a high density. And it's also the biggest iron core of all of the terrestrial planets in the solar system. The second explanation that kind of makes sense is maybe because all of these seven planets are filled with iron oxides. You know that same stuff that makes the surface of Mars red? But unlike surface of Mars, all of this would be going all the way down to the core. Now that's a very good explanation as well, but it still doesn't make sense that all seven of them would have this. We know, for example, that several moons of Saturn and Jupiter, such as Titan right here, do have a kind of a strange mixture on the inside, where the silicates are mixed with different water compounds and form these unusual structures on the inside that give them very specific densities. Something similar could happen if you were to mix metals, or iron in this case, with various oxygen compounds. But there should still be some sort of a density difference. It's still kind of difficult to imagine that all seven planets would have exactly the same densities and exactly the same structures. And the last and the third explanation here is, well, it's also kind of unusual, but kind of makes more sense. In this case, the scientists imply that it's possible that the large amount of mass of each of these planets is made out of water. And more specifically, the middle planets here would most likely contain some sort of a liquid ocean. The outer planets would be made out of really large amounts of ice. But the inner planets, specifically the three inner planets, would have a very large atmosphere of water gas, which would also in turn increase their overall size. Kind of similar to the very thick atmosphere we see around Venus, for example. And for this explanation to work well, each of these seven planets would have to have a very specific amount of water on the surface. It doesn't really matter what they have on the inside, they'll probably still have different cores and different um, iron composition, but the presence of water has to differ 
In order for them to have these properties that we're observing, and to have the sizes and the masses that we're seeing, which also implies that at least three of these planets potentially have a liquid ocean on the surface. But here, on some of these planets, this would also mean that water would have to represent about 5% of the total mass of the planets, especially the outer four planets, whereas if you were to look at planet Earth, our planet only has about 1% of mass being water. But of all of these three ideas or three propositions, the one about water actually makes the most sense right now. Although it's also possible that it could actually be a combination of two or even three of these uh, propositions. So maybe there is a lot of water on some of these planets, but they also contain a lot of iron oxides as well, and possibly even some sort of an iron core. So all three ideas and three propositions currently kind of make sense. Nevertheless, all of these discoveries of TRAPPIST-1 present the star system as one of the most unique star systems we've ever discovered, with seven planets that are extremely interesting for many different reasons, some of which of course being the fact that they probably contain liquid oceans, and also don't seem to be very different from planet Earth in terms of the mass, size, and of course density. Now whether they actually look like this picture right here, and whether we discover signs of potential life here, is unfortunately not something we're going to know until we take a look at these planets with more powerful telescopes. Luckily, James Webb telescopes should be able to tell us a lot more about this star system in the next few years. But for now, that's all we know about this unusual star system. We seem to be discovering new things about it every single time there's a new study, and we seem to be discovering new mysteries as well. But hopefully, in the next few years, we'll have a definitive answer about what's really happening in the star system and whether we're going to find something absolutely incredible on the surface of these unusual planets. One day we might be able to visit them, but it's probably not going to be anytime soon. But anyway, that's all I wanted to mention for now. Check out the study I mentioned in the description below and all of the additional information there as well. If you've enjoyed this video, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that I'm wearing right now that you can also find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.